Well, there's, there's always, um, if you're a Kiwi and you come to Australia, there's sort of pluses and minuses to that. Um, I noticed one of the minuses is that I'm now, um, no one works for Australian Customs, do they? I'm now noted as a person of interest. Um, when they saw me bringing in the What the Fat box, I'm serious. I'm noted as a person of interest for bringing <laughs> um, books. The good thing is I, that I escaped New Zealand, um, and the good thing about that is that um, two days ago we put out a new, new nutrition guidelines, which are the same as the old ones, with the extra <laughs> caveats of um, low-carb, high-fat is bad for you, paleo is dangerous, and intermittent fasting um, is definitely not proven and probably dangerous. Um, so that's what we're dealing with, folks. Uh, and also, I lived in Queensland for 10 years, so, and my, two of my sons were born here. So it's sort of good. Although the entire time we were here, um, New Zealand was hopeless at rugby, and this was a John Eels era, and used to beat us all the time. Um, and the fact that I'm here tonight, um, <laughs> and that sort of reaction makes me feel deeply uneasy. <laughs> uh, don't laugh. Right, but what we're here to actually talk about is um, science and public health. The, the idea in the, in the Mark Sisson sense of the word is that you know, what we would be aspiring to in modern humanity is living long and dropping dead, this idea that um, you would live a long, full and happy life, um, and that would be the opposite to what happens in modern society, which is this idea of living long and dying slowly, because um, Australians will suffer a dozen or so years of disability on average um, before death. It'll cost the country a lot of money, um, but it'll make you and those around you unhappy. Um, and it could be so much more fun. And you can move around the world. And this is actually, if you do do the low carb um, cruise, um, and it goes to Vanuatu, I'm pretty sure the boat goes past this, but you can't get off. This is an item, the, the southernmost port of Vanuatu. And it's just a reminder um, at least when I was there, that there's these remaining outposts of humanity where there's a good deal of this living long and dropping dead going on. Um, they don't have food and nutrition guidelines per se. They don't have a s sign on the village wall, the food pyramid or whatever, um, but they do have a deep, um, close knowledge of nutrition and what makes them well beyond that. And that's the same as every traditional society, they've had that. Uh, and so you'd see this sort of um, rapid decline in, in a couple of weeks and then when people end up getting to, to a very old age and they basically do die of old age, which is what we're after. Um, that's not true across the Pacific and I just wanted to pick this because it was a place that I went that was pretty much the worst of that. This is Tarawa, it's a, a coral atoll part of a country called Kiribati. It's three degrees north of the equator. Sort of looks all right there, eh? It's, it's 40 kilometres long, it's 200 metres wide. Um, there's unfortunately 45,000 people on there now. Um, there's no local food supply. That lagoon's polluted. The um, offshore fishing would have been good, but they sold that off to the Taiwanese. Um, and, uh, you know, you're, you're there with the health promotion team, and I'm showing them how to measure fasting blood glucose as a measure of diabetes, and you send them away and come back in the morning. And of the 10 people in the health promotion team, no one's got a fasting blood glucose under 10 millimoles. Um, and then you get into the, which is diabetes, of course, and then you get into the community and it's running at about 60%. And then you go to the hospital and you go, what do you guys do here? And they're like, oh, quite a lot of deliveries of babies. You're like, well, no kidding. Um, um, we treat a bit of cancer, not very well, and we chop people's feet off. It's like, oh, yeah. Um, how much of that do you do? Oh, just depends on the month, but usually between about 15 and 25 a month. <laughs> and that's, that's in a population of 45,000. You do the maths there and see how that turns out. Um, I mentioned those two islands because um, in both cases you walk around with these, these um, I was working for the World Health Organization and your tool is a sort of form of the food pyramid, now with um, red meat excluded as well, bummer. Um, it's quite a week for bad science, wasn't it really? Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, exercise more, and, and you know, eat more of this um, base of carbohydrates. And this isn't what they do when they are healthy, um, and you shouldn't tell them to do so. Um, and here in Kiribati, that's not going to help either. It's not what they ever have eaten, and it's not what what will help. Uh, and you sort of get to thinking that 
things happened in science and health because there wasn't a science of food yet we ate quite healthily then science came along and the scientific method offers so much and still does right like you think of something um, it's a good idea or it might be um, you're not really sure so you go and test it and depending on what you find you might keep that idea but often you'll change your mind so science involves the changing of your mind constantly the idea that half of what you know is wrong um, and the idea is to figure out which half that is. And that's the way it's played out in modern medicine, seriously. Um, uh, that at any one time that's about right, about half of what we know is wrong and we're not sure which half. And uh, the scientific process has been really good for things, but, but what happens in public health, especially public health nutrition, is through the 60s and 70s it got quite hard. Um, and the access to information was limited. You had to be a member of the club in some ivory tower somewhere with a library card to the med school library. Um, and only you had access to that information. And so a few people knew this. And so then we asked those same people for advice. Um, and that's where the difficulties start. It starts, we need science and good science, but when you put the, pe the scientists in charge of giving advice, then what happens is their humanity takes over. Um, because when we give advice and we're confronted that that was wrong, humans don't change their mind. They retreat deeper into their own belief. It's called dissonance. In the political sense, it's called the vision of the anointed. And you've seen this in Australia, I'm sure. So, um, how many prime ministers have you had? <laughs> <laughs> it's the one thing everyone can laugh about. You can even laugh at yourself. Yours is, you know, you're chasing Italy, for Christ's sake. Uh, uh, but rather than being um, ready to change your mind when confronted with data to the contrary, we retreat deeper into that. We say it would have been right if we'd only done it on a bigger and bigger and better scale. And that's exactly what's happened and is still happening in public health nutrition. Um, the idea that, the f that fat, um, dietary fat, uh, fat in your blood, um, being fat, um, you know, it had some logical basis. You know, fat has twice the calories. Um, it sort of looks the same, it's certainly spelt the same, um, it just doesn't turn out to be true. And unfortunately that's led to a whole plethora of uh, way we talk about and think about food that, that I think um, needs changing. Here's a new hypothesis, um, and, and I, I wrote this for cardiologists, because if you're talking to cardiologists you have to use words that... Um, are bigger than normal to give yourself credibility. <laughs> no, that's how you do it. So um, rather than going, you know, um, metabolic health and thing, you'd need to say something like atherogenic dyslipidemia um, would be more, but you know, um, poor metabolic health is primarily driven by the glycemic environment, um, especially sugar and fine carbohydrates in the context of insulin resistance. In other words, it's dietary carbohydrate, um, particularly sugar, um, that drives um, all of these problems that range from cancer to diabetes to heart disease to some of the neurological problems. Um, and if you believe that to be true, um, and, and we still need more data on that, um, then if you talked about this word, a balanced diet, which I, I find is thrown around um, meaninglessly, then you would say um, you'd want a, normal, a, a diet that would work for people is one that normalises blood sugar and stops you hypersecreting insulin, insulin this hormone that... Um, manages the sugars in your blood um, and, and stores them away in places. So straight away that's going to tell you something that um, the amount of carbohydrate that people will tolerate depends on the individual and it depends on the point of life of that individual. So um, there's points in life that it's really favourable to become insulin resistant. Um, a teenage girl, um, when you're pregnant, um, a woman going into menopause, all of those are times where you're favor it's favourable to store more fat, um, to shunt nutrients into different places. Um, like I'm a male, so uh, <laughs> probably just age affects me with age and things like stress or poor night's sleep, um, alcohol, and those things can drive insulin resistance as well. So um, just a, a quick bit of science, because I think this is just important to be able to, to talk to other people about. Uh, you know, the, the evidence on low carbohydrate, high fat is an intervention. It's not new. Um, there's not a lack of trials. There's probably 50 on 
randomised control trials now when you, you put these things head to head with other trials. There was a good meta-analysis that came out just the day before yesterday <coughs> showing that carbohydrate restriction was really the most effective of those strategies. Um, this is such a trial. The orange is the low carb people. Um, this is the low fat people. These are measures of metabolic health or things that we regard as risks to your health. They all improve more going down is important for everything except for HDL cholesterol which should go up, um, which it does. They improve more on the low carbohydrate diet. So that's important um, and interesting. Um, the same trial, these are markers of inflammation, the idea that um, the blood vessels in your body get slightly damaged and that healing process um, is a problem, inflammation. Um, and this, this again is important that a diet that's high in fat and low carbohydrate is profoundly anti-inflammatory and I think most people are missing that um, in the modern um, diet context. Um, there's also this idea, this is about weight loss. People go, oh, all diets work because it's about eating less calories than you consume. And in science, actually in life, that's what you call a truism. It's true. Um, it's impossible. You can't defeat that law of thermodynamics. To be um, leaner than you were before, then you have to somehow burn energy up and you'll have to consume less and expend more. But it doesn't des that describes an open-loop system. And hum human bodies, of course, are a closed-loop system. Um, and you can compare weight loss on different diets. This is called the A to Z diet study. It's, it's um, four different types of diet. Each one of those bars is a person's weight loss over 12 months. So you can, uh, and I think this is an important concept in science. Um, so here's what happens. If you randomize people to a low carb diet, some people, that's the green, lose um, some weight. Some people, nothing happens to them, that's the orange. And some people get fatter, that's the red. And that's important to know that in any treatment, um, it doesn't always work. And this is true of drugs, it's true of surgeons. Um, in fact, I was just reading about a type of back surgery, um, which I know nothing about, but you know, they say, well, if you smash this vertebrae up, we can, we can inject this super glue type concrete stuff into your vertebrae and it could work. And they say, well, how many operations would you have to do for one successful operation? The surgeon's excitedly says, oh, 18. <laughs> and you're like, shit, I don't reckon I'd you know, would you do that? So you got one chance, and they, what about harm? Oh, that's about three and 18. You know, you wouldn't choose that, would you? Because you understand now this notion of number needed to treat and number needed to harm. Um, and you can understand that in drugs as well. And those, these are questions that are worthwhile to ask your doctor whenever they want to give you a medication, whenever you, they want to give you a treatment. Um, and if there's been trials done on it, then that you will be able to know the number of people that were treated versus the number of people that benefited, that nothing happened that were harmed. And I think things will surprise you um, when you start to look at it. So you can look at these across. These are two different types of Mediterranean diets in the middle, um, the zone and the learned diet. Um, less benefit, um, more harmful on average. And this is a typical conventional low-fat diet. You know, so on that basis, people, more people benefit and less are harmed um, when they get the low carbohydrate diet treatment. But the next slide from the same study I think says more than anything that we need to know about um, health, science and metabolism for what's known at the moment. And that's this, that when you look afterwards and you look at who loses weight on these different diets, just the low carb and the low fat now, um, you'll lose fit weight on the low fat if you're insulin sensitive. In other words, your body easily moves carbohydrates, um, but you won't if you're insulin resistant. And insulin resistance predicts weight loss under conventional things. It doesn't help the people that most need the help, whereas the low carb helps both groups equally. And that's, that's really important. The people who have the most trouble losing weight, the people who are most at risk of diabetes, <coughs> cancer, heart disease, and dementia are insulin resistant. They have trouble moving carbohydrate easily around their body. If you were a Martian coming from, well, I don't know if there's actual Martians, but if, if you were coming from another planet, theoretically, this is a thought experiment, um, and you look down on humans and said, oh, hey, there's this thing called diabetes and obesity, um, and they go, well, what causes it? Oh, well, high insulin, because you can't dispose of those nutrients, it slows you down, makes you fat. They would go, oh, why don't they just eat, why don't these humans just eat less of it? You know, on first principles, it's an absolute no-brainer. Um, but I don't think you should trust me because I'm a scientist. Um, 
you want us to do stuff, but you don't necessarily want us to, to, to take our advice um, as gospel because that is dangerous to your health and that's proven time and time again. I think you, you want us to be able to communicate effectively and make up your own mind. And things have fundamentally changed, haven't they? Because there's now, you now have access to the same information I have, plus you have a whole lot of people in the blogosphere and Twitter interpreting it, and you can make what you want of it. Not only that, and I'm strongly in favour of this, is the idea of the N equals one experiment, of trying something, it doesn't have to be forever, trying some particular things and seeing what happens. Um, when you do that, I'm all for embracing failure because you will fail. You will do something and you'll feel terrible. For example, I did some fasting last week and by the end of it I couldn't get to sleep. Um, you know, I had fasted for quite a long time, but you know, so I stopped and ate some food again and I felt much better. Um, <laughs> You know, I was grumpy and angry and um, generally not nice to know, according to my family. I thought I was all right, but, you know. <laughs> so, but, th but that is important, isn't it? This, this idea of taking some responsibility and seeing how it goes um, and keep changing it up. Quick fire um, questions that I was just thinking about. Can you eat too much fat? I reckon you can. Um, and I think that's a mistake. People um, think that this is an unlimited fat diet. Look, if you hold yourself down and force fat down, then you still can't defeat that law of thermodynamics. You'll get fatter. Um, what about the blood, my, the, the, my blood lipids matter? Yes, they do. Um, but what drives, this is a feeding experiment, what drives, this is triglycerides, fats in your blood, what drives fats in your blood are primarily carbohydrates. So this is the fats in your blood when you did a low fat, high carb diet. And when you eat three times more fat and creating three times more saturated fat, the fats in your blood, interestingly, only go up half the amount. That's important to know. Fats in your blood do matter. They're driven by carbohydrates. Um, the fats in your blood, things like triglycerides, um, HDL cholesterol, all go in the right direction with all types of fat, monounsaturated, some polyunsaturated um, saturated fats. Saturated fat does drive up sometimes LDL cholesterol, but importantly it doesn't affect the small dense apolipoprotein B particles in that. So eating fat I don't think um, affects the fats in your blood adversely. If you want to look at some of the numbers, um, I think the triglyceride number that your doctor gives is, is important, um, probably the most important number. It's totally responsive to dietary carbohydrate. This is a great graph that um, Ken Sakaris, pathologist from Melbourne, put up a couple of years ago. Um, it just shows you that if you can get your triglycerides measured by your doctor, then you can predict these um, small dense apolipoprotein B particles in your blood. So if, if your triglycerides are under one, you've got virtually none of the small dangerous particles. If they go above that, you start to get mostly those. Uh, and that's important. So I think triglycerides and HDL cholesterol um, are important numbers. Do you need to exercise? Well, of course you bloody do. You know, like, <laughs> not there because that's a shore break and, and you're going to get smashed. But, um, you know, I just find that discussion bizarre. Well being depends on humans moving. You know, it might have so much to do with weight loss, but exercise is crucial for your health. Hello. Um, <laughs> can you have your kids on LCHF? Well, mine are, they just don't know it. And they seem to be fine, like he's surfing, whatever. Um, <laughs> but here's an interesting graph that I dug up. Um, this is some, this, these are these sort of starvation studies that this guy um, Cahill has done over in the 50s and 60s. You couldn't do them now, not ethical. But if you starve um, like little wee babies and stuff, uh, <laughs> and infants, but the good thing is you don't have to start, to, this is the, the, the time it takes to get them into nutritional ketosis. And it's just a matter of hours. This is a normal human state, and they get into it very, very quickly um, because of, of presumably the relative size of their brain and the need to protect that brain with ketones. Um, and you can see as they get older, it's still in the matter of hours for, for, the, for the all kids. Um, and then for um, adults, it's, it's, um, it's a matter of days. So, you know, let's not think nutritional ketosis is some dangerous state for kids. This is a normal and natural state. 
Now, my kids go to what we call, you, know, you can laugh at me, I'm, I'm putting myself up to be laughed at, we go to the dairy um, <laughs> in our jandals. Um, <laughs> I mean, we go to the convenience store in our thongs. Um, the kids do, um, and they buy sugar from time to time, I'm sure. Um, and so they're in and out of this low carbohydrate sort of zone. Um, and I think that's perfectly all right. I don't think that's a dangerous state. Um, this is the one that keep, people keep asking, what about climate change? And the answer is, I don't know. What about it? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> Um, so yeah, thanks for having me. Look, enjoy the rest of your day. There's, there's going to be a lot on offer here. Just lap it up and um, I think take what you can because there's, there's, there's bits and pieces that you can try yourself. Um, for the athlete minded, I've just actually finished the manuscript for a What the Fat Sport Performance, which I'll have out on ebook in early December. It's been really, I'm really proud of that. It's been a really good learning curve and there's lots of new stuff. So stay tuned. Thanks very much and um, yeah, beauty. Thanks. Thanks.